All right, we're live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the return of Fitter and Faster Insider on the Fitter and Faster Swim platform. Today, I'm your co-host, Mike Murray, and today we are thrilled to introduce you to our future Fitter and Faster Insider host, Olympian, coach of Nation's Capital Swim Club, the incomparable outside-the-box thinker, Jeremy Lynn. There he is. What's happening, Mike? How are you? Good, Jer. How you doing, man? Doing great. I really uh, am super psyched to get an opportunity to spend some time with not only you, but everybody listening today. Uh, I always have a blast when Fitter Faster gives me an opportunity to say a few things. Uh, it's really kind of cool to be on the, the being asked question side. I've done several times where I've gotten to ask some, some pretty special people some questions. So I'm pretty psyched about it. Yeah, we're excited to have you. And, and I know that uh, we've been talking about bringing this back for a while, so it's good to get going. Uh, I want to remind our viewers that you stay at, if you stay to the end of the webinar today, one lucky winner will receive a free fitter and faster mask and beach towel. If you're anything like me and you have your masks hanging on like your car blinker stick and you got your window open, I think I've lost like three or four masks. So this is a good way to grab an extra one if you stay to the end of the webinar. Um, I also want to remind our viewers that if you spam the chat box, we're going to bounce you right out of there. So, Jeremy, I want to jump right into it. And I want to jump into it thinking outside the box like you're accustomed to doing. And part of the reason why you've been very successful both as an athlete and a coach is you, you have the ability to think outside the box. You've had success at every level in this sport, culminating in winning medals at the Olympic Games, 17-time All-America at Tennessee, incredibly successful career as a young coach. What's the most important thing that we can talk about with our athletes, our staff, and our parents during these incredibly challenging and uncertain times? Yeah, so um, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the ability to think inside the box. We're always going to be spending our time outside of the box. Um, you know, this, this year marks for me uh, – 40 years at the pool. I'm 43 years old. I started uh, on my first swim team when I was three years old. And, uh, and this year also marks the year that I've been a coach longer than I was a swimmer. So it's a, it's a pretty interesting year for me. And, and swimming has meant so much to me over that period of time and, and, and through, you know, swimming at, at a level where, you know, I was, I was just learning to, to be a part of a swim team, to swimming at an elite level. And the same thing from the coach, coaching end is, is going from the very bottom, teaching a, a kid how to swim to getting to work with some of the most elite athletes in the country and in the world. So it's been really great to kind of get the perspective from all angles. Um, and I think, you know, the most important thing about the sport never really changes for me. Uh, and the message that we're giving our, our families and our kids hasn't changed no matter what we're in the face of. If we're in good times or challenging times, um, you know, the reason why I do what I'm doing and I, I realized what I got from the sport of swimming was, was a value system and in, in how you carry yourself as a human being. And it, and it, you know, being able to participate in a sport like ours it's a, is, is a delayed rewards thing and it's a long-term commitment thing. Um, you know, you really have to kind of be, to be successful in it, you have to portray certain values and emulate certain values that are going to help you make decisions that are good for yourself within the sport that help carry into your everyday life and, and the things that you're going to do in the future. So, um, you know, that value system, it just doesn't change. It's the one constant that we can really, uh, you know, focus on making our, the number one thing we're trying to learn when we do this sport, it, it's, it's not necessarily how fast can I go? Because I think when you commit yourself to, to being a part of a really great value system, um, and, and really be honest about what it means to adhere yourself to that, you're going to be a great swimmer. So uh, that's really where we, we center ourselves. So that's, I think it's something with certainty in an uncertain time. Absolutely. I was mentioning to you when we were preparing for this, and I mentioned it yesterday when I had Samantha Arsenal Livingstone on, I have an assistant coach who said to our athletes, we have to stop thinking about if, we get back in the pool and start planning for 
when we get back to racing. And we're very fortunate that we've been swimming now since uh, the second week, third week of May, uh, albeit mostly open water and in some outdoor 20 yard pools, wherever we can find a spot. But I am fielding a lot of questions from my athletes about how do I plan for this when I don't know what meets are coming up? Are you hearing some of those same questions from your athletes? Yeah, and I think, you know, we were just, you and I were just chatting before we got on this about the idea that you can, you can spend your time thinking about what's been taken from you, the opportunities you didn't get to have. Man, I missed my big meet. You know, I didn't get to show everybody how good I'm going to be. Uh, you know, I've had all this training taken away from me. You could focus on the past or you could focus on, you know, it's so uncertain what's going to happen in the future. I'm not really sure if there's even going to be a meet on the horizon in the next four months. Why am I doing this? Or you can focus on the present. And I think that's probably the most important thing we can do is keep our, our swimmers and our athletes present. What can I do right now to focus on something that I can control to make myself better? Yeah, it might not be the same form as it used to be, but there's something you can do. And I think focusing on staying in the moment, which is something we've always taught, is really an important part of, uh, uh, you know, keeping everybody grounded to what they're doing right now to get better. About 15 years ago, we met for the first time. We were at juniors down in the pool deck and we were talking about different things. Uh, and, and ironically, we, we discovered that my Aunt Tammy was one of your coaches. And so uh, we've had that connection for a long time. The thing that I've always respected and noticed about you is that you're making it fun on the pool deck, whether you're at a meet or you're at practice. Do you think that premium on fun is even more important now because these kids need something to look forward to every day? Yeah. First of all, hi, Tammy. <laughs> I hope you're listening right now. Um, yeah, you know, it was interesting because you, we're doing all this planning. Like we spent nearly three months out of the water and coaches were doing as much planning as they could possibly do to prepare for, you know, what comes next. How's the, how's it going to look and all these things and all these rules that we were making for entry and exit of the pool. And you're going to have to stand still and then move over here and take off your mask now. And, and all of a sudden I started thinking, man, this is going to be no fun at all. Like the one most important part about this, this sport is that the kids come in and have a good time and uh and i was really impressed with how resilient everybody seems to be like as long as you make you know what your expectations are clear and you communicate that well which is what se seemingly we've done as a swim club um within the situation the parameters that they have it's like you know you're coming in for a physical and mental challenge let's have be fully committed to that, you know, whatever it is we're doing, be fully committed to it. And then once you're fully committed to it, you're freed up to have a great time doing it, especially when, you know, everyone around you is also fully committed to that. You're really freed up to just have a blast doing it. And, and I'm all in on anything I do. I'm going to go there and I'm going to have a great time doing it. So like getting an opportunity to spend time with you today, all in, let's go. Absolutely. I, I think you touched on something really important there, and it's it's something that I've been thinking about lately. We are always under the gun as athletes and coaches to prepare for something, right? So in our mind, there might be things that we've wanted to do in the past that we haven't had the bandwidth or the ability to try or experiment. So this has become a really important time for me anyway to try to do some different things. You know, I don't have the 120 minute practice available to me every day. I might have a day like tonight, we got 90 minutes. What can I do inside that 90 minutes that's gonna be a lot of quality, that's gonna get them excited about swimming again. And it's a way that I haven't necessarily thought of before. Are you finding yourself going to some of those places too? Yeah, I was three hour sessions every day, plus doubles two days a week. And, uh, and uh, you know, I got really used to planning for three hours and we took full advantage of, of using that time uh, for teaching purposes uh, and training purposes. And we really, really used every moment within that three hours. And then you go to, to a, a 90 to 110 minute session and things change 
drastically. Some folks are only getting 60 minute sessions in a 30 yard pool. So I think you have to look at what your parameters are. And I love what you're talking about. Uh, and I'll ask you about that open water stuff that you're doing. Sounds really awesome. But, uh, you know, you take the parameters that you have that you're given and you say, how can I take full advantage of this? Um, you know, and, and then do the best you can do with it. And, and you should, you're, the way you're going to get to your goals is going to have to change. So I think that, that you know, you, there's never going to be a constant in any goal you're going for. You're going to be put in different situations. How are you going to adjust to make sure that you can continue to be the person that's going to achieve that goal? Um, you know, never, Absolutely. Never taking no for an answer is a tremendous thing, you know. That's a great segue into, you know, what we've been doing from an open water standpoint and not taking no as an answer. When I first proposed it to my staff and, and to a lot of families, I got a lot of reasonable, rational feedback. Well, can we get 155 summer registered athletes through the lake every day? I don't know. Can we do it in, in terms of social distancing? How is that going to work in the parameters of our state guidelines, of federal guidelines? What's it going to look like? Can we get wetsuits for all of the kids? And all of a sudden, as we started to investigate each piece, we got one foot in the door. And then we do a little bit more research and we get another foot in the door. Now, all of a sudden, on any given night, Victor Swim Club is moving 80 athletes through the lake. And then the other half of the team is moving through three different pools. And it's a logistical challenge every single day from a staffing standpoint. But if you're collaboratively in it together to create opportunities for your athletes that they might not have, it's always worth that risk. And, and you created possibilities. Created possibilities. And, and we've opened up, quite honestly, a whole other avenue for people in open water that maybe they were nervous about or didn't know enough about. And so that's created a lot of goodwill with our families just providing the opportunity. It builds, I think, a little bit more trust that they can count on us during times of uncertainty and struggle. And an, a segue into what we're really talking about is now we have athletes who are going to college. Their seasons are going to be drastically different. They have a lot on their plate. Our seniors didn't get to have prom, didn't get to do all of the traditional things that have happened for seniors in the past, all of the things that you look forward to from ninth grade all the way on. And here they have something consistent that's gonna give them something to drive towards. I don't know if we're gonna have meets, but there's gonna be a time when we do, and I'm going to be swimming in college. So I need to put my best effort and attitude forward. And I think that's a great segue into talking about some of the anxieties and the trepidation that both parents and athletes have during this time. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, you know, the, the simple fact is, uh, you know, uh, 85 percent to uh, to 100 percent of, of athletes that are that are uh, swimming at the club level want to go on to higher education one way or the other which generally means that there's a swimming opportunity from them for them uh you know pretty much every athlete that participates in the sport there's an opportunity out there for you to swim at a higher education level now i just think you have to see if that there, there's a fit for you and and certainly when we're looking at the way things go now it changed a little bit, but, you know, at its core, not necessarily a, a tremendous difference when you're making a decision if, if you want to swim in college and what that means to you and being part of a sport in college, you know. It's a dream of so many kids to, to have that opportunity to participate in a sport while they're doing higher education and be a student athlete. And I think that that's a really important uh, part of experience as a whole. And I think that's what every kid should be looking at. How can I have a great experience when I go off to college? Is swimming going to be a part of that? Uh, and we really look at, uh, uh, you know, making that decision based on a, a, a pretty set formula and it's always kind of been the same and it hasn't it won't really change for us as we move forward uh you know this year next year uh or whatever we're looking at you know and the certainly the number one thing to us is uh you know being a student what are you looking for to get from your academic uh 
uh, experience, you know, and, and I think if you do things out of order and don't think about being a student first, um, you really find challenges in, in what it is you're trying to do with your life moving forward. Do you agree with that, Mike? Oh, uh, absolutely. And, and again, that, that's a great point to bring up in terms of what you and I had talked about in preparation for this, because you have a pretty unique formula uh, and I'm, I'm putting it up uh, on our chat box right now for folks to see. But when you start speaking to your athletes about what they're looking for in terms of commitment to schools or what schools have to offer them, you put together this formula. And basically the focus is on the academic, the community and their ability to swim at that level, whatever level that is. Yeah. The questions that we're getting as club coaches all across the country right now I didn't have an opportunity to swim at my season culminating meet. So my times aren't at the recruitability level that I thought they were going to be. I, I didn't get a chance to take the ACT or the SAT to raise my scores. Maybe I'm looking at an Ivy League school where, where those things are super important when it comes to the academic mm -hmm. index. So those are the questions I'm seeing. But you mentioned, you know, these are uncertain times, but we still have these core uh, principles when it comes to selecting schools. So can you talk to me a little bit about your formula that you put together for your athletes? Yeah, sure. So, you know, obviously we, we put academics first. The reason you go on to, to college is for higher education. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to know exactly what you're going to study. But I think it's important to know how you fit in to an academic atmosphere. And, and that that is more than just, hey, what am I going to go learn when I go there? Um, you know, do I learn better in big classes or small classes? What kind of support am I going to need as far as uh, getting help? You know, can, do you have tutor situations? You know, so you can come up with a whole list of questions that you need to ask for yourself that, that are important to help you on the academic side of what you're trying to achieve short term and long term. So on a four year period, an eight year period, a lot of folks have a great idea of what they want to do beyond college and what it's going to take to go through. Um, so it really helps them narrow, you know, where they're going to be looking to study. So if somebody wants to go in, 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 into engineering, which seemingly every male in the Northern Virginia area wants to go into engineering and they all have 4.0. So it's amazing. Um, I live in a really special area for academics and it, it makes it so easy to be a coach. But, uh, you know, you, when you have an idea of what you want to study, it gives you an, uh, the ability to kind of narrow down that search. Even if you don't have an idea of what you want to study, but you know how you need to study big classes, small classes, uh, you know, interpersonal connections, things like that. I think it really helps as well to help you understand what kind of school you need to go to or want to go to in order for you to get what you want out of your education. So we Absolutely. Really look at that point first. And I think by doing that, you can take, you know, the thousands of school out, schools out there and narrow that, that, that uh, view down to maybe a couple hundred schools, maybe 10 schools. If you're really focused on academics, maybe three or four schools. So I think it really is a great way to kind of start your view of what it is you're trying to do with your future. Um, and when you think about it that way, um, you know, it is your future. It's your next four to eight years. Um, so we really think about community and what that means uh, next. Before we even start thinking about a, a swimming experience, you're going to live in this community. You know, for me, University of Tennessee, Knoxville, Tennessee, Knoxville will always be my home. Um, you know, I loved it there. It was a great place for me. I became the person I'm, I'm going to be, you know, or was going to be moving forward in my life. It meant so much to me. And that that being in that place was a big part of it. So the community at large meant so much to me. And I think that's when you can, you know, you get your academic questions put together and then you start thinking about what is my community questions? How far do I want to live from home? You know, do I need to be in state or out of state with some economics with my family? You know, um, 
Do I want to go to a school with 50,000 undergrads or 5,000 undergrads? You know, does it have a, a tremendously big athletic department or a little bit smaller athletic department? Am I in the mountains? Am I by the beach? Am I in the city? There's so many questions based around community and community at large that I think it's really important part of, of the decision you make and how much fun you can have while you're having a college experience because part of it is not just swimming and not just studying but really enjoying the community you're a part of so i think that that's a big, big question that everyone you know maybe looks at a little later than they would their swimming experience but it's a huge part of what you're doing and if you're happy with your academics and in your community certainly you can focus on the swimming experience you want to have um you know and, and quickly i mean swimming experience can run from you know, the whole idea is that you get to participate in the sport and have a great time doing it. Um, and I think that that gets lost so many times with student athletes. They think, man, I got to go to the fastest possible school that I can qualify to go for. And a lot of times that means you're not going to get as much participation and experience that that makes the sport fun. So we, uh, you know, we even break down sharper in the formula. When we pick a championship meet, um, you know, for our club team, we look at, what it takes to score top 16, um, you know, you can have five junior national cuts, but if you're not going to go there and final and score and get nighttime swims, you're not really learning the process or getting to participate, maybe going to sectionals this year and winning two events and, and getting to swim in finals and five events is a better experience for you. And we teach them that through their swimming experience so that when we look over to the college experience and the swimming side of things, how does that plug into? You know, am I a scorer at conference? Do I find myself on the top 10 list? Will I be getting an opportunity to participate? I'm going to be scratching and clawing just to get a chance to go to a dual meet. And this one sounds like more fun. So we're looking for that good connection for, for the swimming side of things. You know, some people want to go and be challenged by, I need to not be the best swimmer and really push myself. So I need to be the best swimmer when they walk in the door and get that attention. So I think knowing yourself within the swimming experience is a tremendous deal as well. So, you know, we take all those pieces and really trying to educate educate uh, folks so that they go and they have a, you know, I found early in my career, we're sending kids to school and they weren't having much fun and they weren't, you know, really performing that well. And it, it didn't have much to do with them as as a human being but i think we just needed to, to to better our formula for helping them make a good choice for themselves so i think looking at those three pieces and figuring out what your questions as an individual is a tremendous deal i love how in your model for beginning that formula the first two things that you have are academic and community yeah. You're you're leading with those two things. Yeah, and I think and I, do it backwards. They think about their swimming first and then put sidebar to those things. And, and it just puts you in a position where you might not have as good of a time. And like we said, let's have fun doing what we're doing. It's got to be a great experience. And I think if you select a program where you're really going to make an impact, emotionally, you're going to be much more comfortable. And not to say that we're striving for comfortability with our emotions all the time. We want to learn to challenge ourselves and take risks. But you also want to be in an environment where you matter, right? Mm -hmm. That's so important for a student athlete. When you matter in your program, I'm going to be in a better place for my community. I'm going to be a, a, a higher level contributor to my peers. I'm going to feel like I have control of what I can control at my school, I'm gonna be doing well academically. I could have NCAA A cuts go to the University of Texas and never make their NCAA team. Yep. yep. And I, I think we find a lot of kids fall into that trap sometimes. And then, well, here I'm swimming out of my mind, I might be going lifetime backs. I'm not even making NCs. Yep. So, you know, I, I think it's important for us coaches and for our parents to look at your first two bullet points on your flow chart there and see how we fit in. The swimming piece can come later. And, you know, we talk to our athletes and I know you talk to your athletes at NCAP about this, but parents and athletes should be looking at what scores inside the conference and how they would fit into that program. I think using that part of the model, it gives, I mean, here's, here's the thing, kids, coaches, swimmers, parents, 
you have to have a realistic view of where you fit in. Everybody wants to have that view of, well, you know, I feel like I can be good enough or, you know, my time's, you know, they say I, I can participate with them. So let's do it. Um, have a realistic view of, of where you fit in uh, to get that participation model. And I think that's so important uh, to, to understand and using that scoring at conference model is a great way to do it. Um, you know, if you're if every conversation you're having with the college coaches, you need to get a little bit faster. Maybe you should uh, what we don't say lower your bar, broaden your horizon. Correct. Horizons. Uh, give yourself a little bit more variability in the schools you're looking at. Don't look at exactly the same school, you know, as far as the swimming experience is concerned over and over again. Look at some different variations of that and how it would work for you. And, uh, and if you if you really uh, know yourself a little bit and you're and you're honest with yourself, you can find a great experience that way. And I think I think that that's the most important thing. And, and I'm, I think college coaches have done a great job of, you know, there, there's not a lot of time and a lot of money to do this. They're doing a better job of being up honest about how you'd fit into our program. You know, Absolutely. that's an important thing, too. Um, I think it's an important thing for, for a swimmer and a parent to ask right away, um, you know, and, and make sure that they are clear on, you know, where do I stand with this, you know, so that they can make good decisions for themselves as well. So asking your coach, honestly, asking the college coach, honestly, and looking at that formula, how do I fit in? It's that the numbers will not lie to you when it comes to that. I, I th you just mentioned the word honesty, and it's critical in this process because if you're not, you're going to end up in a situation where you're in way over your head. And I think the most important thing that we can do as as club coaches is offer that perspective, uh, share our examples, but make sure that the athlete understands that they own their decision. Their decision, you know, they can be influenced by their friends. They can be influenced by uh, if they're at a very high level, a coach trying to convince them to go to school there, but they have to own this decision-making process. Is that something that you talk about with your kids? Yeah, we kind of look at it as their uh, their first real adult decision because it will be one that affects them for the rest of their life, and uh, and they have to own that. Um, you know, most of them are young adults, turning 18, 17, turning 18 when they make this decision. And, and it is really probably their first adult decision and one that we we want to put on them. We want to educate them well and, under, and understand how their family is going to support them through this. Most of the time, financially, they're going to be supporting them through this. So it's an important part of the decision making process. But ultimately, that young individual should be making that choice and hopefully an educated one. Right. Right. I, I completely agree. And that's that's the challenge, right, of educating parents and athletes that, you know, I understand that that big name school is really enticing, but I, I want you to really get an idea of what it would be like for you there. And, yeah. and everybody wants to wear the T-shirt, you know, um, and, and it's, you know, look where I'm going. Uh, I got the T-shirt on and it and happens within the club level, too. I want to train in that group. And then they get there and they're like, what the heck am I doing here? This, this is a terrible decision. And I got my T-shirt. I'm going to go hide there in the back row and not try. You know, so you want to make sure that, that you're not putting yourself in that position where you're just going out for the T-shirt. That's a great point and a really good illustration that I think happens all the time, right? We see so many athletes this day and age, and, and part of it is just, the evolution of our sport at the collegiate level, you'll see commitments coming in in May for the next year. And then our kids are starting to say, well, Mike, should I, should I commit? Well, let's really take our time. And sometimes they have the ability to take their time, but other times there's expiring offers. So navigating that part is a particular challenge. When you have, and you've had in the last two or three years, some athletes who are performing at a very high level and have a lot of really great choices programmatically, what are you telling them in terms of their commitment and how to navigate that process? Certainly, I don't think anybody should make a decision before they're ready. 
I think that that's an important and and ready is different in everybody else's everybody's reality. Ready is different. You know, ready might mean uh, you know I've talked to everybody. You know, if you've talked to everybody you needed to talk to and you have all the questions answered you needed to have answered, maybe you're ready to make that choice. If you're making a decision before then based on somebody pushing you to it, we you know. We look at timing as a tremendous deal. It's just like making an Olympic team. Timing means a lot, you know. Uh, timing uh, for when you make your choice for for college swimming, it should be on your timeline. Um, so if you feel like you're pressured to make a decision, maybe it's just not the right fit for you. And that's another reason why we foster options. You know, okay, so this the timing for this isn't going to work out. I'm just, I'm just not ready to make the choice, but they're pushing me to do it. If that's the case, maybe it, it just wasn't the right decision for you in the first place. So I think that, that that should be an important factor is, am I ready to make this choice? I mean, if you're feeling pressure, and I think one of the, the big things college coaches try not to do ever is make that pressure feeling. They're going to be honest about it. Hey, our money is closing up. You know, if you wanted to make that choice on the money side, it would have to be by this time, you know, and, and I hate to do that to you, but it's there. If that doesn't fit into your timeline, you know, maybe maybe there's a better decision out there for you. And I think uh, I think they're being honest about that and they have to be. But I think it's important for for uh, our student athletes to make choices on their own time when they're ready instead of feeling pressured to do so, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And you and I both appreciate, enjoy, and in many cases, love when our athletes are featured on Swim Swim or Swimming World. And that's a nice perk for our club and for the athlete and the athlete's family. But there's another side to that coin, too. And that's the anxiety that it can create with parents and swimmers. So what are some of the strategies that you use to mitigate that? Sure. Um, especially when the, the kids really buy into how much, uh, you know, social media means to them. And, and, and that uh, uh, and we, know, and, and the, we know our children, I mean, our young student athletes, they uh, social media does mean a lot to them. And and, and that if you think about it uh, rationally and we try and have that rational conversation, it's like, how long have you been noticing these commitments? Oh, for two weeks, you know, and I've seen. I've seen 150 commitments and I'll say, OK, 150 commitments and there's mm, probably 25,000 graduating student athletes that are going to be going to university next year. It's not that many. That's right. Give them a little bit of perspective. Yes, you're seeing these things happen, um, you know, and then. Uh, you know, and, and when they get that little bit of perspective, I think, you know, and then you go right back into your conversation. Where are we right now? You know, what, you know, how that conversation go yesterday, you know, so you get back into to their moment and what they're focusing on. So just giving a little bit of perspective means a lot. You know, yeah, you're seeing things happen on social media, but there's so many more out there that, that really aren't doing that, you know, so that you're not in a, in a bad position. You know, so I think it's important to understand that. Absolutely. And, you know, the last two weeks, you and I have put together some bullet points and I'm going to share them on the chat here in a second. But mm -hmm. I want to talk about some of the things that both parents, athletes and club coaches and, and in some cases, high school coaches who are very much a part of the process for some of our athletes. Um, and I'm going to put them up on the chat right now, but I want to talk about them first. Um, the notes that we shared that parents and athletes should consider is number one, the viability of the athletic department. Is there long-term viability for the program? You know, we, you and I have probably both coached athletes who've had their program cut. Um, yeah, um, even before uh, we call, we call pre COVID uh, training and racing 1.0 and then uh, post COVID 19 2.0. So even in 1.0, we would watch kids commit to uh, programs and two days later, watch that program be cut. So almost seemingly like the coach and the staff would have known that. Um, and then, and, and they still took commitments from them. So, uh, you know, interestingly, I think it's such a challenge. Yeah, I think it's a question that's that's worth 
a young student athlete and or when they get the opportunity, you know, communication itself has changed uh, for, for how you work things at, at this point, because you're not doing face to face meetings with with staff members, at least in person. Um, you're not getting, uh, you know, on campus tours led by another student athlete. Um, you know, so a lot of that interpersonal connection and opportunity to ask those questions face to face aren't there. So I think a lot of programs, uh, uh, college programs that are with Salt are sitting down via a FaceTime call, via Zoom call with the parents and the student athlete and giving them an opportunity to ask questions like that, that are really poignant questions that are, you know, hard ones to ask for for somebody that that's going out there for the first time and asking real time questions but i think are really poignant important ones to ask you know hey uh i know that you know you you guys you know really depend on the on the football team and their success doesn't look like you know what what's the viability of the program if the football season doesn't run off this year have you guys had those discussions you know I know you guys carry nine scholarships based on the fact that you do have football. You know, uh, how do those how are those nine scholarships going to be affected uh, if if the sport's not there? You know, is there going to be a championship meet this year? I think they're realistic questions to come up with and ask. You know, um, we've watched seven programs fall to the wayside in the past uh, in the past three months, um, and it, it's terribly unfortunate and uh, and and i think um it, it's probably not the end of it that's why i think it's important to to be willing to ask that question uh about viability of the, of the program so it's an important thing to be focused on um you know and and in the the staff is going to be as willing and and open as they can possibly be about what they know Things are constantly evolving for them as well, and I think they're going to be open about that. Um, so it's not only changing on our side all the time, it's also changing on the collegiate side all the time right now. So I think we need to be pliable to that, and, but willing to ask the tough questions. And I think in, I think you'd agree with me that, as you said, most of those college coaches are going to be fourth white. Um, if if they're able to, and and in situations, I, I would hope that you know uh, an honest and open conversation can take place. But a lot of that is fluid too. Sometimes they they have no idea, so it's it's always a challenge uh, uh, when when it comes to having that tough discussion. So I I appreciate your thoughts on that. There was one student athlete this year, his first year, he went to Eastern Michigan. They cut the program. He transferred to East Carolina. They cut yeah, the program. we had one in East Carolina. So, uh, and, and uh, what a, what a, that's tough. And I think that's, you know, to talk about the transfer portal, that's something that, that's really become a big thing in the past uh, three months. Um, you know, for active college athletes, um, uh, making a decision based on, on how it looks like the viability of their program is going to be. I think you've seen that transport portal open up. Uh, in, in addition, I think you've had time over a three-month period to say, you know, maybe my experience isn't going the way I wanted it to go. I'm going to make the decision now. Uh, right. I think, you know, that also changes uh, – what a, a, an incoming freshman or or junior looking at making their decision. You know, when you're getting kids that are doing redshirt years in college, um, the change of the financial picture of their their college program and or how long that they have that swimmer that, that's capable of filling the spot that maybe the recruitable swimmer is filling. So again, question should be asked. Hey, do you guys have a lot of athletes that are redshirting this year? How does that change for your recruiting or your finances for the next two to three years? Um, in addition to the transport portal, you know, understanding, uh, you know, hey, I'm looking at this school, but I've noticed that some athletes have transferred out of there. I wonder why. Maybe you don't ask that coach that specific question but you raise that question with your club coach or something like that so you can kind of get some, some understanding of that so understanding what's going on with the transfer portal and what's going on with redshirt years and i think it leads kind of into 
talking about what a gap year means for for uh you know student athlete that, that's still in high school i think that we've seen that as as a new thing uh, you know it's obviously not a brand new thing i think it took a gap year last year because she was a young graduating senior and it made sense for her to spend a little more time maturing before she went to, to college but uh, uh i mean on your end have you seen the gap year greater decision or well you know you know in our house uh we we have two college athletes uh, one of whom uh was going to be at the ncaa division three meet and one who was swimming at the ncaa division one meet both opportunities taken away mm -hmm. um you know michaela decided to go pro instead of waiting around for one more year with with covid um, and Savannah, you know, we don't know if we're ever going to get that, that opportunity back. So, uh, you know, that's been a challenge. There are athletes on my program right now who are taking a gap year this fall. Mm -hmm. Um, and there are athletes at other schools like Arizona state that are redshirting this entire year. Uh, so we're starting to see that. And those are some difficult conversations too, because, if you decide that you're not going back and a lot of your peers, your teammates are, you know, that there's an emotional component there. That's a, a challenging hurdle. Have you been having those conversations? Yeah. And certainly, uh, you know, we always love to learn from others experiences, good, bad, or indifferent. And, uh, and we had that young student that took that year this last year and the bruises and bumps you on the good afterwards. I don't think it may be fun to play for them. Um, you know, uh, just had graduated all, not only her friends but on the team, she had plenty of friends on the team, you know, once that hadn't graduated yet, but she did watch those others move forward. Not to mention all the kids in her hometown that moved forward. You know, so she's, she's kind of rolling solo with her, her parents, and her swim team, and that's all she's got. She doesn't even have academics anymore, except for maybe a college course she's taking online. You know, so things changed greatly for her in that gap year. Not necessarily all for the positive. There was some good growing and maturity and strength in swimming that did happen for her, but it wasn't without its challenges. And I think those those challenges need to be talked about. Again, if timing is a thing for you, that year seems to make more sense. Maybe it's a good choice. Put it on the table, but ask the questions about it. Don't just go, that's what I'm doing, because I hear that's what a lot of people are doing this year. Wash, you know, make an educated decision on that, but understand both the positive and the negative aspects to making the choice like that. Yeah, the, the gap year is a huge commitment because the first two months you're in your routine, you're training with your club or whomever, it feels pretty normal. You start getting into January, February, March, you don't have a peer group that's your age. You're interacting with your parents, your use, siblings. Use retrospect and go, let me think about who I was a year ago today and who I am today. Am I the same kind of cat I, I was? I'm completely different. And I bet you in a year from now, I'll be completely different too. So the choice I'm making is for the me now, not the, the me a year from now. You know, it's going to be a tough, challenging year. And to understand that is important. No doubt about it. Um, it brings us to our next bullet point, Jeremy, which is uh, institutional finances that are available to the student athletes. And this becomes a really important part of the conversation as we move through the collegiate uh, recruitment process. And we always have these conversations at Victor. Am I going to be able to qualify for a scholarship? And how do I initiate that conversation? I have uh, ways of doing that within our program, but when a parent comes to Jeremy Lynn and says, hey, is Johnny going to be eligible to receive a scholarship? How do you go about, number one, uh, addressing that, that question? And then number two, instructing them on to how to engage the coaching staff with that question. And my response is always, be totally honest and ask if you qualify for scholarship, Mike. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think, uh in the past, a financial question used to happen closer to the end of the process, a little more like, okay, we're feeling pretty good about things. Let's talk about finances and what that means to you. And I think um, 
you know, that is is really taken a turn to being more of a front end question, probably in, in the first conversation. First of all, um, there's there's a lot going on for for every college staff um, with the amount of folks we're trying to communicate with, make connections with. I think that it, it does them a service for you to be straightforward with, hey, listen, I'm the fourth kid in my family, uh, all of them in higher education right now, you know, find the answer to what I'm looking for for my college decision. What's your financial picture right now? And that, you know, begs the question of what's your transport portal look like? What's your red shirt situation look like, you know? Uh, how many scholarships do you have to offer? Is there money for somebody like me? And I think, you know, have this the strength of character to ask that question early and honestly, really kind of comes off well with the college coach. They go, wow, this guy knows what they want. And I think just like when you're going for an interview with a job, I don't think about being, I'm getting interviewed. I'm interviewing you. You know, is this a choice I want to make? So, you know, having those things that you know you want and goals and, and, your, and, and what you need to communicate out front and doing that, you know, confidently, politely, caringly uh, is a really important thing. I think uh, it shows a lot about your character to, to a swim coach. Plus, you get the answer to the question that you need. You know, we get that big question out of the way right out of the gate. And if you yeah. have the confidence to ask a college staff that they're going to feel more confident about you. And quite frankly, the process from there is going to be a lot easier because it's already been talked about. Yeah. Now you're not, uh, uh, you know, tip chatting about, you know, uh, what do you do? What do you do in your spare time when the conversation doesn't need it, you know, or or man, at least we got that out of the way and we can we can set our set our goals on you know, getting to know each other a little bit better and seeing if that can be there. I think getting those kind of questions on end are important. And I think, you know, like I said, a lot of college programs are doing a great job of sitting down and communicating with not only the student athlete, but also the parents so that they can kind of ask some of those tougher questions. Um, and it's so, it comes so much better from the student athlete than coming from the parent. So maybe you had that conversation beforehand with your parents. Certainly, anytime I think you're having a conversation, whether it's email, whether it's on the phone, whether you're on uh, Zoom, whether you're doing a FaceTime, if you kind of have a bit of preparation, maybe you've written down some questions for that, uh, for that, uh, you know, that silent moment where you feel super uncomfortable because you're talking to somebody for the first time that you don't know at all. And you can go, oh, yeah, I forgot to ask you about uh, what, where do you guys eat at what you <laughs> out there, you know, like, let's get the important stuff, you know. But I think having those, those questions prepared, uh, it gives you the ability to, to have a, a little more fluid conversation. Um, so, you know, and, and that means preparing alongside your parents and, and, and having the same answer to, to questions that you need to ask. So you don't go, mom, what is our financial picture <laughs> when you're on the line with the college? And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it brings up a really important part of the process that I have to really educate our parents on. Um, and, and that's getting your FAFSA fixed and getting your FAFSA done early on so that you can make those uh, corrections and make those adjustments and move forward. A lot of times parents are overwhelmed with the FAFSA and it is not an easy process. I have to do it twice every year, so I'm getting better and better at it. But um, getting that FAFSA done early and getting a picture of what you're gonna look like is super important, as you mentioned. Are you, are you, are you working on that with parents too? I'm about to be. Yeah, <laughs> um, I think that that's a it's a really great point is, is understanding how finance is realistically order. you know, so um, it's a great, great idea. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm not the parent. My daughter is almost two years old, so um, we're definitely squirreling away, but don't understand what it is to be the parent of a, of a cop student athlete um, in, in college. So um, I think that's that's. As far as our conversation is in a unique position that you, you're in, as opposed to myself. Yes. 
Yep. Um, and, and you get, as you go through the process, it, it becomes a little bit easier, but the first few times it can be really challenging, but it's a really good thing to have done and ready to give to those college coaches, as well as your unofficial transcript to have prepared. You know, if you give those things to your college staff, the prospective college staff early, then you can really have the deep conversations about, okay, is this even, is this even a viable place for you to go to school? Mm -hmm. um, it's just going to streamline that process a lot. You know, the next bullet point that we have, Jeremy, is what will the class structure look like in the fall? And, and this is something that we really haven't had to consider in the past because we're just so used to going to college, uh, having our schedule, knowing what it is. There's so many different models that are happening this fall. Um, and I think Go. the models are there, and I think that the, the, the things are evolving constantly for them. It's not going to look the same in in, uh, in February as it does when they first get started. So I think you know you just understanding, uh, being willing to ask the questions that that. What does it look like now? Where do you guys think you're headed with it? Um, are students coming back on time? Are students living in the dormitories? Um, you know, so just understanding what their processes are, I think, is a really important question, not only for, for student athletes now to understand the ones that are already engaged in, in university, but ones that are moving forward just so that they get, you know, you want to understand that they're the college is doing everything that they can do to make sure that they keep the kids safe and healthy. You know, so asking those questions, I think, is a big deal, um, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. I think it's so important, especially as we're in this COVID situation, because every place is so different, right? Mm -hmm. And so getting getting that idea is, is critical. Um, and then our next bullet point really tacks on to that one is what is the student life situation going to be like? asking the college coaches about what student life is going to look like at school XYZ. Yeah, I mean, so there's your community question too. I mean, so for the next six months, what does it look like? And when, when you think student life, you know, I think live, eat, and then, and then social probably to follow that. And I think, you know, you're probably looking at, you know, I've heard everything from, from freshmen living in, in upperclassmen, uh, uh, you know, housing situations to dormitories being open. But I think you got to ask that question. There's actually, I've heard student athletes living in hotels. I mean, they're moving them into hotel rooms because they lost dormitory space or it's too much, too many people in one spot. Um, so I think understanding the, how, how, universities are managing that and, and the viability of moving forward, looking with that model um, and, and how it affects you on, on, a, on a social level and how how you feel like you're going to be able to manage a situation like that. So I think it's important, like, geez, uh, I didn't know I was going to be going to live in a hotel. I'm not so sure I want to make this choice um, fun for about three days and it's going to be different cooking on a hot plate every night. Right. Right. And and these are the questions that we're considering going back to our earlier conversation about whether or not you're going to take a gap year. Mm -hmm. You want to be cooking in your uh, microwave fridge combo every single night. Yeah. You know what I mean? And trying to go uh, perform at a high level athletically. Uh, it's pretty challenging. So uh, I think, you know, understanding those choices and making those questions it's something that you, you, you ask. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I know we're getting close to the end of time and we did, we talked about a subject that I thought I think is so important to make sure that we touch on in its performance and how you can talk to a, a, a college perspective college about performance, you know, Hey, geez, I didn't get my championship meet, you know, and, and I've noticed in the conversations that I've been having, you know, with college coaches, every single coach that's having a conversation with them is telling them, they were going to go this time, promise you, you know, and they're hearing that across the board. So it's almost a push. They can't really say, I believe you. I believe you. I, I can tell you that uh, a couple of things that influence the college coaches, uh, uh, you know, the history with a program. Uh, does the program have a history, number one, of helping athletes be uh, successful? 
Number two, of being honest in their conversations with college coaches. So if there's any coaches out there listening, always be honest. You know, you have to be 100% honest about what that student athlete has to offer interpersonally and, and as a teammate and as an athlete. Because um, if you don't be honest about the product and then the product shows up, they're going to remember that. So if you're being honest in your communication, I think that that's a, a tremendous deal, uh, you know, as far as being a coach. And, and then what can I do to to show performance? Obviously, we have the new competitive, uh, you know, I, I can do my uh, virtual meet, inner squad meet, and plug in those times. If you're doing a virtual meet, if you're doing an inner squad meet, hold up the phone, have your teammate hold up the phone, get a video of it. It's meaning a lot to college coaches to see you swim. They want to see how you use your body. They want to see how you look in the water, how you touch the water, what your habits look like. Um, you know, so those are really important things. Um, and, and interestingly, having a, a, a conversation with a college coach the other day, it came to me because they always say, how are their underwaters? It came to me because you want to go, oh, yeah, their underwaters are really good or they're really working on them and they've improved so much. I almost feel like they want to hear you say their underwaters are terrible because then they have so much room for improvement, <laughs> you know. Um, so it, interestingly, I think you got to be honest about it, you know, especially as a coach like, hey, you know, I can tell you that, that their tempo, depth, range, you know, needs improvement. So we have a lot of room for improvement or, hey, they're working 15 yards every time right now. They just need to get better at, at power and tempo. You know? But uh, I think getting an opportunity to put yourself on video, performing, being the best you. And, and giving a, a coach an opportunity to see that so far away. Hey, we can all go Facebook Live. We can all go Instagram Live. And, uh, you know, you, you can even start a YouTube channel for your team if you're having a virtual meet. And there it is. There's our performances that we can show right there. Yeah. I, th I think that's, that's significant to mention. If I'm a recruit, Jeremy, and I continuously uh, contact a college staff and they're just not getting back to me, What's your suggestion on that? Well, you know, the great thing is that you, every student athlete has, I mean, they should be doing the majority of this process on their own and really and really putting themselves out there. But you have a support group. You have your parents and you have your swim coach. And a swim coach, uh, you know, uh, that's working with a young student athlete that's in this position of, of choosing a college should be there to support them in certainly in this way. Hey, I've reached out to these guys. Remember that email I shared with you and we worked on, uh, on, on, you know, crossing my, my T's and dot my I's and taking out the, the words we didn't need. I sent it off to them. Haven't heard from them. I filled out the survey, still haven't heard from them. You know, do you think you could shoot them a call? Coach, shoot them a call at least you're going to get an honest answer for him. Hey, I know this guy filled out your survey, shot you an email, hadn't heard from you. I know how busy it is right now. I just wanted to check in with you about him. Can we talk for five minutes about him? Luckily, I got three athletes we're talking about anyway. Two of them you're already recruiting, one you haven't spoken to yet. Well, like, let's let's chat for 20 minutes, and, uh, and then at least you're going to get an honest answer. Hey, you know, I saw him. Looks like a really good up-and-comer. I'll reach out to him and say, hey, what's up? We're looking for you to get a little bit better, whatever it is. At least you have the honest answer. So I think the coach can really help the student athlete when they find themselves in that position. And, and at least you have that answer and you can move forward at that point. You know, sometimes if you're not getting the communication and seemingly are a great fit, if they're not great communicators, maybe it's not a great spot for you. Yeah. For sure. And Jeremy, what are some questions that we can ask specifically about the way that the college group trains? What are some good things to ask our staffs about the way that they train, where I might be placed as a prospective student athlete? How do I engage those conversations? Yeah, so if I'm the student athlete and I'm asking that question, uh, you know, the first thing I'm going to say, you know, what we're doing as club coaches is trying to give them uh, 
10 different ways they could plug into a different schools. You know, we want to give them as many tools as possible. I want them to be great at 10 events. You know, maybe this college sees you swimming these three events and this college sees you swimming another three events. Ask that question. How do you see me fitting into the program as far as what my profile is? Ask that question, you know, hey, I know my, you know, I feel strong in my profile in these five events. Which of those five events would you see me swimming? You know, hey, we're looking to help you get better at all five or we need a 200 flyer. And that's that's what you're going to be locked into is the two fly, one fly and 50 fly. Know that answer. OK, uh, get that answer. And then it's like, well, who do those guys train with? Do they do mid distance free? Are they an IM based group? Where do you see me fitting into training? Or can you tell me a breakdown of what your training groups do? I think college coaches are really willing to share some workouts based on what their their groups do. So all of them break out different ways. All of them break out with different specifics. Some of them work with all of the coaches on staff. Some of them only work with one coach on staff. I think it's important to, to understand who am I going to be working with? I think it's also important for a young student athlete to understand the, co the coach that's recruiting you most likely will not be there four years later. When you graduate and that's just the nature of what college swimming's about college coaches go into assistant coaching or or uh, volunteer coaching even in order to move forward in the process for themselves just like you're doing as a student athlete you're going from your club team onto a college you're making a choice to move forward you're not staying with your club team <laughs> you know uh you're moving forward into the college ranks and, and it's just like what a, a college assistant coach would do is move forward so understanding those asking those questions and understanding how long has your staff been together you know so i think those, those are really important questions in and certainly when you're when you're talking coaches talking to a student athlete making the list about what are the questions we're going to talk about in our second phone call or whatever these are great ones you know how did your training groups break out? How do you see me fitting into your program? Um, you know, I want to swim on a national and international level, long course meters. I need to have the answers to that. Do you guys focus on that? You know, so is a long course an important part of your training progression? Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's really important, Jeremy, for coaches in this process and especially young club coaches, when you have your first athlete at a very high level to not be afraid to engage. I think there's a lot of trepidation with some young coaches reaching out to, you know, some of the bigger names in our sport, whether it's a Terry McKeever or a Carol Capitini, or if it's a Braden Holloway, I think a lot of younger coaches are afraid to make that initial conversation. Fair to say that it's so important to be available to speak with these people. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, you think you, you those are the tough ones to to reach out maybe to but i think that you should be reaching out to every level i mean for for every one special swimmer i have that's going to swim at, at cal berkeley or texas or georgia or whatever it is uh we've got a hundred that are they're also just as special they're just not you know I, maybe going to that big big school i think having a conversation with all of those coaches is really important and, and i always try and put myself forward to you know when, when we're getting down to the mean potatoes not let allowing a student athlete to move forward without having that conversation with them um you know that college coach so that they understand that that athlete is cared for and 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 you know we're their success means something to us um you know and and hoping that the coach can feel that from them so we definitely have those conversations. Um, and, uh, you know, me, Mike, I'm not afraid to talk to anybody. So I'll call up whoever. <laughs> I, I really appreciate your time today, Jeremy. And I'm so excited for you to take this fitter and faster insider over. And I, I'm so thrilled that you're going to take this into all different kinds of directions. And we're going to come up with an awesome title for this show. You know, we, I pitched a couple to you. We'll wait to release some of them when we when we decide. But uh, we're going to have you back on two weeks from tonight with a new topic. And we hope everybody comes over with us. And we hope you enjoyed the presentation on reaching out to college coaches and college recruitment in times of COVID. I think the most important thing that Jeremy, Jeremy and I agreed on today was, listen, there's not a lot of changes. There's just some new considerations that you have to take into mind and be aware about 
and, and be mindful in the present, you know, and there are a lot of options that are available to you. I don't want my athletes to think that COVID-19 is limiting what they're capable of doing at the collegiate level. We might have to put it on pause and putting things on pause at 20, 22 years old or 18, 19 years old, incredibly challenging. But Jeremy, you know, you and I look at a year and a year is like that. So, you know, people have the ability to make some choices. They're not easy choices, but Jeremy, would you agree that that our athletes still have a lot of swimming ahead of them and there's a lot of choices available to them right now? Amount of opportunity and this is a lifetime sport and uh, and and you know the if it teaches us anything, it's how to, to to be successful in the face of adversity. This is no different. It's just a different adversity. So um, you know, champions uh, are gonna be born from this and champions are gonna grow from this. So uh, be one of them. Jeremy, thanks so much. I do want to announce to everybody that Chris Sawa, you win the face mask and towel. So thanks for staying to the end of the webinar. Appreciate you. Jeremy, we look forward to Fitter Faster Insider with a new working title coming in two weeks from tonight. You and I will put together another great show. So thanks for your time today, Coach. I really appreciate it. Come on back. See us. Same bat time, same bat channel. Sounds great, Jeremy. Thanks a lot, guys. And uh, thanks for being a part of Fitter and Faster.